All right, well, this video here is about bike touring in general. What is bike touring? It's almost like Bike Touring 101. Remember riding your bike when you were a little kid? Remember the feeling of freedom and exhilaration you felt as you were pedaling down the block? It seemed like riding across town was a big adventure. Well, even at my age, I still get that same feeling every time I ride my bike. Who knew you could ride your bike across the country? There's probably as many different ways to go bike touring as there are bike tourists. And so I'm not gonna show you how to bike tour. I'm gonna show you how I bike tour. Bike touring is a great way to see the countryside. That is if you don't mind fresh air and exercise. Bike touring allows you to slow down, get back to basics, and simplify your existence. There's nothing that makes me feel more free than bike touring. So basically, today we're going to talk about the basics of bike touring. You know, what is bike touring? And how do you go bike touring? Why would someone want to go bike touring? Basically, bike touring 101. So before we get into all the what's and the how's, maybe we should talk about the why's of bike touring. One reason I really like bike touring is because it really breaks life down into its basics. When you're on a bike tour, really the only thing you're thinking about is getting down the road. You gotta think about eating, you gotta think about breathing, you gotta think about resting when you get tired, and where you're gonna stay at night. Someone told me that 12 miles an hour is about the perfect speed for a human to travel. Walking's too slow, and driving down the interstate at 70 miles an hour in a car just doesn't really excite me that much. But again, put me on a bicycle, got the wind in my face, blowing my hair back, what's left of it, and I'm feeling free. I think the main reason I like bike touring is for the exercise. It's good cardio. It's good for my heart, it's good for my lungs, it's good for my legs, it's good for my whole body. Bike touring helps me keep my weight down. It's a great calorie burner. I'm not a naturally thin person, and if I didn't do a lot of bike touring, I'd probably be a lot closer to 300 pounds. So it's a good way for me to stay young and in shape. One of my personal goals is to be able to ride my bicycle across the country when I'm 70. I'm 58 now, so that's just 12 years away. I figure in order to pull that off, I'm going to have to bike tour every summer from now until then. Bike touring forces me to stay moving. I can stop and rest a while on the side of the road, but after a while you got to get going. Otherwise you're going to be sleeping on the side of the road after dark. And knowing that is what keeps me going. But as I get older, I definitely feel myself slowing down. It's not so much the years that matter, it's the mileage that takes its toll. The second reason I like bike touring is because I love to travel. Bike touring allows me to combine two of my favorite activities, exercise and travel. Even when I was a kid and the family went on a road trip, I just wanted to be one of those dogs with his head sticking out the window, with his tongue hanging out, and I'm sure if my dad would have let me, I would have. But bicycle touring lets me go to places that I never would normally go to, go through towns that I would never see. Bike touring gives you a chance to meet people that you never would normally meet. I've done most of my bike touring in the United States, in the lower 48. I haven't been to all the states, but I've been to most of them. And I just love going through little towns. You get to see America for what it really is, not what you see on TV, through somebody else's lens. And maybe I'm biased, but I for one still believe that America is the greatest country in the world. And if you have any doubt about that, go for a bike ride. Go see America. Talk to people, see what they're really about. Probably the biggest reason I love bike touring is for freedom. You know, freedom! I remember when I was a little kid, the first time I got on a bicycle, riding down the street with the wind in my face, just feeling free. And even now as an adult, when I get on my bicycle, it always gives me a sense of freedom. But there's almost nowhere you can't go on a bicycle. Yeah. I saw you in Yellowstone, saw you, I guess you were looking at a bird. 
like a couple days ago or something. You going across the country? I'm going to Florida. You're going the wrong direction. I'm going the right direction. I want to see the country. Oh, I see. So what is bike touring? Simply put, bike touring is traveling by bicycle. It's kind of like taking a car trip, only on your bike. Bike touring and bike packing are two different things. Sure, both are traveling by bicycle. Bike packing is a lot like backpacking, but with a bike. Bike packing is done mostly on unpaved roads and trails. The emphasis is on primitive camping and roughing it. Usually, you have to carry days worth of food and either filter or boil your water from a stream. Bike packing is definitely a more rustic experience. Bike touring is done mostly on paved roads using most of the same services that motorized travelers would use. I can camp out or I can stay at a hotel. I can cook out on a camp stove or I can stop and eat at a diner. There are lots of options and I'm limited only by what's available and my own resourcefulness. Bike touring can be hard, but you can make it as hard or as easy as you want, depending on your skill level and your appetite for adventure. In other words, your desire for self-torture. So I'm not going to teach you how to bike tour. I'm just going to show you how I bike tour. So take it for what it's worth. So if you want, I'll show you how I do it. When I went on my first bike tour, I really didn't know what I was doing. My youth and inexperience were exceeded only by grit and determination. But over the years, I learned from other bikers what to carry, what not to carry, what to wear, and where to stay. I learned a little bit about bike maintenance and how to take care of myself while traveling. But I learned the hard way, through trial and error and by making mistakes. I guess I'm one of those people that thinks you don't need to know everything before you go. I don't need to have all of my questions answered before I start. I try not to let a little thing like inexperience stop me from having an adventure. The way I look at it is whatever I don't know now, I'll figure out along the way. Just try to use good sense and don't get yourself too deep in over your head right away. Did I tell you I learned mostly the hard way? Yeah. Now my way of bike touring has evolved over the years. It's really changed. When I was younger, I was more on a budget. I had to save money. So I did a lot more camping. I would stay at state parks, campgrounds, forest service campgrounds, anywhere cheap. I would buy food at grocery stores and cook my own food, so I had to carry extra cooking gear. In my younger days, I had less money and my body could withstand more punishment. I was more prone to do other wilderness type things like backpacking and rock climbing and canoeing. I really enjoyed camping in my younger days, so I'm no stranger to sleeping outside. But now that I'm older and my bank account and waistline have grown fatter, I'm less likely to sleep on the ground. And eating at restaurants is so much quicker and easier than cooking out on my camp stove. Okay, so maybe I've grown a little soft over the years, but I've got to live with these old bones and listen to them complain. Where are you guys from? New Zealand. New Zealand. Um, where are you going? Going to Astoria in Oregon. And where'd you start out? Yorktown in Virginia. Nice, coast to coast. Coast to coast. And, and what are your names? Graham and Windy. Windy. Yeah. Awesome. Alright, so where do you stay? These days I stay mostly at motels. Sometimes they're nice motels, sometimes they're not nice motels. But if I have a chance to get an air-conditioned room with a shower and sleep in a bed, I'll take it. But if a motel room's not available, I always carry my tent and sleeping bag with me just in case. My second choice would be a campground. But I'll take a state park campground as long as there's a shower or at least a place to wash up. I don't mind primitive campgrounds. Camping's a little bit cheaper, but it's uh, more work. You've got to set up your tent, roll out your sleeping bag. In the morning, you've got to break it all down again. Roll up your sleeping bag, fold up your tent, pack it all up, and that takes time, that takes energy. I always carry my tent just in case, but I'd much rather stay at a hotel. It's a little bit more expensive, but it's easier, more comfortable. You know, when I was 23, I didn't mind sleeping on the hard ground. But now that I'm older, sleeping on the ground, at least for me, is kind of overrated. Sometimes, if I'm riding through a real scenic area where there's lots of national forests or national parks, I like to camp. But if I can find a nice, quiet, primitive campsite that's legal with some solitude, 
I'm more likely to camp out. Sometimes I like waking up in the morning outside in a wilderness setting. But sleeping at a noisy, crowded campground with 500 of your newest and closest friends doesn't really appeal to me. But when bike touring, there's usually lots of camping options. Most national parks and national forests are very biker friendly. There's lots of state and national parks that have designated hiker biker campsites set aside. So anyone that comes in either on foot or on bike will always have a place to stay. Now you may have to share that area with other hikers and bikers, but usually they're good people. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <laughs> Some park campgrounds have a no turnaway policy for cyclists. So just in case the campground's full, they'll always find a place for cyclists. It's not that way everywhere though. Cars can always drive another 20 miles or 100 miles to the next campground, but it's not so easy on a bike. But usually finding a campsite or a hotel room's not a problem, except maybe on the weekends, on a Friday night or a Saturday night. That's when hotels and campgrounds tend to fill up. There's nothing worse than getting to your destination at the end of the day and finding out that there are no vacancies. Everything's full. That'll make you scramble, but like I said, I learned the hard way. But by making a reservation in advance, it gives me peace of mind, knowing that I'm definitely going to have a place to stay at the end of the day. And this allows me to enjoy the day a little bit more. I don't have to hurry. I can take my time and get the most out of the day. If I've got a reservation, I'll ride almost till sunset. On well-established bike routes like the Transamerica, a lot of the small towns are real biker friendly and they'll even allow you to camp out at city parks. Along the Transamerica, some of the local churches or firehouses will host cyclists. If you're ever in a tight spot and you get stuck and there's no place to stay, I suggest check with the local police and ask them if there's somewhere you can camp. Local police can be very helpful sometimes. If you just explain to them your situation, that you're traveling across the country and you're stuck and you have no place to stay, sometimes they'll let you just sleep at the city park. I've done that before, but don't just sleep at the city park without telling them because sometimes they'll wake you up in the middle of the night and tell you to move on. You know, I'm not much into stealth camping. I know a lot of bike tourists like to stealth camp. I think there's a difference between stealth camping and primitive camping. Primitive camping would be done on public land where it's legal, but there are no services. You know, it's, you're just camping out in the woods. You know, it's, it's a national forest or something like that. It's public land. I would probably define stealth camping as just pulling off the side of the road and setting up your tent wherever you are. I think the reason they call it stealth camping is you don't want to be seen. And I know a lot of people who stealth camp, they'll pull off into the woods where it's quiet and out of view. It's not always on public land. For me, I'd rather camp on public land where I won't be bothered by anybody. But I would hate to camp on private property where I'm trespassing and be woken up in the middle of the night by a sheriff. And worse yet, be woken up in the middle of the night by an angry landowner exercising his Second Amendment rights. But that's just my personal feeling. I'd rather be comfortable at night and not have to worry about it. But it's your trip, and I'm not your mother, and if you want a stealth camp, I say go for it. Just be kind. One reason I don't care for stealth camping, really, is that if somebody's stealth camping and they get caught trespassing, that makes all the rest of us bikers look bad. And I might be the next biker to come along. I will say this, at the end of the day, I like to take a nice hot shower, wash all the sweat and salt and road grit off my body, and put on some clean clothes. That's a big reason why hotel room is my first choice. I don't like to sleep with a day's worth of grit and sweat on my body, and then wake up and put another day's worth of sweat and road grit on top of yesterday's sweat and road grit. If I have to camp out and there are no showers, I'm going to do everything I can to at least wash up. I especially have to wash my seat. And I don't mean the seat on my bicycle, I mean my seat. Now this can be a sore and sensitive subject, literally. It's not just gross, but not washing can lead to some pretty serious saddle sores caused by bacteria. 
My mother always said, cleanliness is next to godliness. And she was a nurse. It's just good policy to keep everything clean and wear clean shorts every day. Again, I learned the hard way. And that's why I always carry a packet of baby wipes. Just in case I can't get a shower, I can clean up that way. The baby wipes kill all the bacteria on your skin and reduce the chance of saddle sores. Kills the bacteria in those hard to reach places, if you know what I mean. It's not a pleasant subject, but saddle sores aren't pleasant either. Give it just a minute and then we got breakfast. So what do you eat? Well, I eat whatever I can mostly, but I gotta eat something. You know, I, I gotta eat breakfast, even if it's just a bowl of oatmeal, something to get me down the road. But I would prefer to eat at a restaurant if I could. I love to eat at those local little cafes, you know, those little greasy spoon restaurants owned by mom and pop. If I could, I'd eat at one of those every morning for breakfast. If there's no restaurants, then a grocery store. A lot of little towns don't have full service grocery stores and the best you can find is like a convenience store, like a gas station, quickie mark kind of thing. In places like that, your choice of food are kind of limited. So that's what I mean by you, sometimes you just gotta eat what you can. So if I'm riding in real populated areas where there's lots of services and I know there's gonna be a place to stop for lunch, I won't worry too much about it. But if I'm riding through real remote areas where services are hard to find, I try to pack some food for the day. I need to stop about every 20 miles or so and get something to eat. Maybe just a piece of fruit or a sandwich or something. Because when you're out bike touring and you get hungry and there's no place to get food and you don't have anything to eat, it's a real drag. Again, I learned the hard way. So I always carry some emergency food. Maybe a couple packets of oatmeal or some walnuts or maybe a granola bar. So what do you do with your bike when you go into a grocery store or a restaurant? It's a little unnerving leaving it out there all by itself. Should I lock it up? Not a bad idea. When I go into a restaurant, I usually put my bicycle close to the window and then I sit by that window so that I can see my bicycle while I'm eating. If I go into a grocery store or a Walmart, I try to bring my bicycle into the store with me. If they'll let me, I'll just bring my bicycle up and down the aisles. But if not, I leave my bicycle inside the store and sometimes the store employees will even watch it for you. I feel pretty safe leaving my bike unlocked inside the store. In most places, I don't worry too much about my bicycle getting stolen, but I do carry a lightweight cable and lock with me just in case. But anytime I leave my bike unattended, I always take my valuables with me, my wallet, and my phone especially. I figure if some jerk comes along and steals my entire rig, at least I'll be able to get home. But I'm pretty cautious about my bike and I've never had any real problems with theft. But there was this one time, I went into the grocery store, and when I came back out, there was this little kid messing with my bike. He was only about four or five years old, and he really didn't know what he was doing, but his parents weren't anywhere around. Fortunately, he didn't break anything or steal anything, and it was pretty easy just to kind of shoo him away. So how much water should I pack for the day? Well the answer to that's easy. Depends. Water's pretty heavy, so you don't want to carry more than you have to. But you don't want to get stuck somewhere without any water either. If I was riding through a real well populated area, I would probably carry about two quarts of water with me. Because I know I'm going to find water along the way. But what if you're riding across the desert? When I rode across Nevada, there were some stretches where there were 80 miles between water stops. In places like that, I would start the day with about seven or eight quarts of water. I made sure I drank half of that water before noon. One, it got rid of the weight, and two, it made sure I stayed hydrated. I never ran out of water, and I never got dehydrated. So how do you navigate? I love maps. I can stare at them all day. I like a good paper map. I usually plan my route in advance, at least for the day. That way I've got a good idea where I'm going and I'm less likely to get lost. Following the adventure cycling routes and purchasing detailed maps is definitely a good way to go. It takes a lot of the guesswork and a lot of the mystery out of route finding. Sometimes maps just aren't detailed enough or roads on the ground change and your map's a little bit out of date. So I find GPS to come in handy. 
I've used Google Maps on my cell phone sometimes in a pinch, but it's not my main navigation tool. I've been in places where my phone just can't get a signal and GPS is useless. If you get lost and you have to ask for directions, just remember this. Sometimes local people give you the worst directions. You're on a bicycle and they're thinking like a motorist. They can't help it, but sometimes they just don't have a clue. I don't get lost very often, but you know, sometimes We're from Madison, Wisconsin. We started in Anacortes a couple days ago. Um, stayed at Bay Creek or Bayview. It was awesome. We climbed all day today and we're going to keep on climbing tomorrow. How do your legs feel? <laughs> Got my first flat today. Changed my first tire ever. Nice. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So what do you do if your bike breaks down? Well, hopefully your bike is well maintained in advance. If everything is properly cleaned, lubricated, and adjusted, that'll reduce the chance of a breakdown down the road. So make sure your bike's in good shape before you even start. But hopefully, if your bike does break down, it'll be an easy repair and you get back on the road quickly. I've fixed plenty of flat tires and broken cables on the fly. It puts a little speed bump in the road, but if you've got the spare parts and the right tools, it's not a big deal. I always carry some spare tubes and a patch kit, just in case I get a flat tire. I usually like to start a tour with brand new tires. This reduces the chance of getting a flat tire in the first place. But if your tire gets damaged, that can be trouble. And I know a lot of bike tourists carry a spare tire with them just in case. It's not a bad idea, especially in remote areas where bike shops are few and far between. Other breakdowns can be a little more bothersome, you know, like a broken spoke or something. And of course, the spoke always breaks on the freewheel side. But sometimes you need to get to a bike shop. And if your bike will still roll, Maybe you can still limp along and get there. Hopefully it's not too far. If there are no bike shops nearby, this is where your resourcefulness needs to kick in. Sometimes a local hardware store might have just what you need to keep your bike rideable until you can get to a real bike shop. And it's amazing what some of these local hardware guys can do. But some breakdowns can leave you like, oh crap, stranded, where your bike is just unrideable. Like, say, your rear wheel suddenly takes the shape of a taco. This is when your resourcefulness really needs to kick in. Fortunately, we live in the age of cell phones. So if you're close enough to a cell phone tower, you shouldn't be in too much trouble. If you can't get a ride that way, you might be able to scare up a ride the old-fashioned way. Stick out your thumb and hitchhike. In my 40 years of bike touring, I've had to do this twice. Don't tell my mother. I love a bike ride that starts and ends on your own front porch, but it usually doesn't work out that way. So how do you get to the beginning point of your ride, and how do you get home after you're done? I suppose if you don't have to go too far, you can use Uber. I guess your choices are planes, trains, or buses. They all have their pluses and minuses. Planes are expensive. Buses are a little cheaper. Planes are quicker, but you gotta go through airport security. You gotta box up your bike. Buses are slow, and you still have to box up your bike, and in my opinion, the bus is the most uncomfortable way to travel. I've taken a bus all the way across the country before. But in a pinch, a bus is still a bus. And it'll get you there if you need to. The public transportation that I've used the most are trains. Amtrak doesn't go everywhere in the United States, but it goes most places, and it can usually get you pretty close to your starting point. On some Amtrak routes, you've got to box up your bicycle. Usually you can buy a box at the Amtrak station. But some Amtrak routes have what they call roll-on service where you can just roll your bike up to the train and they'll take it without a box. And when you reach your destination, you just roll your bike right off the train. Not all Amtrak routes have roll-on service, so you gotta check. Plus, sometimes space is limited, so you need to make reservations. So where are you guys from? We're from Birmingham. And uh, you're just riding the Natchez Trace? Yeah, <laughs> started in Nashville. Today's our seventh day. Your seventh day. And yeah. we were gonna camp at um, What's the, what's the campground up here? The yeah, free Busby. one, Jeff Busby. But the Nats, yeah. they were killing us. So we were like, you know what? I said, I'm gonna go get my second century. So today. So what's a typical day like? I like to start riding early, like when the sun comes up. And that means I gotta wake up while it's still dark. I'm not naturally a morning person, but I've learned over time that riding early in the morning is the best time of day. 
I like to take advantage of those cool early morning hours. So in order to do that, I try to get up about an hour before sunrise. I use the bathroom, take a shower, and try to get something to eat before I get on the road. Taking a shower wakes me up, and I like to start the day as clean as possible. I have to get something in my stomach. It doesn't have to be much, even if it's just a piece of fruit or a bowl of oatmeal. If there's an all-night diner, or one that opens real early, that's where I'm eating breakfast. Then I make sure everything that I came with is somehow attached to my bike, and off I go. If I'm staying in a motel, my morning routine is so much easier. The bathroom is just a few steps from my bed instead of 100 yards from my tent. In a motel, I can have most of my gear ready the night before. If I'm camping out, I've got to break down my campsite and get it all packed up early, usually in the dark. And I hate doing that in the dark. So generally when I'm camping, I get a much later start. If I get on the road and start rolling by 6 a.m., I'm doing really well. But if I get started a little bit later than that, it's no big deal. For me, if I don't get rolling till 9 a.m., that's a late start. I know, and my legs know, that I'm gonna be riding all day long. And so I don't wanna burn out my legs early in the day. When I start off riding in the morning, I ride slow, at least for the first couple miles. I let my legs warm up slow, cause I'm kinda of old. That is, unless I'm starting the day at the bottom of a big hill. In that case, there's not much time to warm up. You really don't have much choice. I like to keep an eye on the weather. I like to know how hot it's going to get. I want to know which way the wind's going to blow and how hard. I want to know if it's going to rain or not, if there's going to be any lightning. If the weather gets real bad, how far apart are the towns and where can I find shelter? If I know the weather's going to get severe that day, if I'm in a good place, I might just take the day off. If I'm riding down the road and it starts to rain, I make sure that my gear is covered up and then I put on my raincoat. Sometimes just putting on your raincoat makes the rain stop. If the weather starts looking scary, then I start looking for shelter. But if there's no lightning and it's just a nice easy rain, I'll just keep riding in the rain. I take a lot of rest stops during the day. For me, it's not a race. I'm not really built for speed anyway. I'm more built for the long haul. As I'm riding down the road, I've got my head up and I'm enjoying the view. I've got the wind in my face and I'm always looking for something interesting to film. It gives me a good excuse to stop. That's probably why I ride solo, mostly. I drive other bikers crazy. I stop at everything and take a picture. And if I happen to be riding with someone else, well, they just keep going. Well, <clears throat> clouds broke up, sun came out, and it turned into a nice afternoon. Yeah, blue sky, who would have thunk it? Well, my bike doesn't break down, and the weather's reasonable, and the wind's not too crazy, and the hills aren't too bad. I'd like to get in about 60 or 70 miles in a day. Below 60 miles just doesn't feel like a full day, but that's just me. Some bike tourists are completely happy with just doing 30 or 40 miles a day. If I get more than 70 miles, it's definitely a full day. I've done a few centuries in my day, but mostly when I was younger. It's been a few years since my last century ride. As I get older, I'm finding myself taking more rest days too. I used to be able to ride 7 or 10 days without taking a rest day. Now if I go 3 or 4 without resting, I need a rest day. Once you get into the rhythm of a bike tour, it really comes down to moving and breathing and eating and taking care of your safety and your health and moving some more and finding a place to rest. I like to start early and I like to start slow but if I can get in about 25 or 30 miles or more by noon I know it's going to be a good day. I'm usually a little bit sluggish in the morning but for some reason even now I feel stronger in the afternoon. If I know I have a reservation for a room that night, I'll stretch the day out and I'll take my time. And on those long summer days when the sun doesn't set until nine o'clock, I'll get into my hotel room right around sunset, and try to get the most out of the day. So at the end of a long day of bike touring, I'm thinking about three things, supper, shower, and a bed, so that I can get ready for tomorrow's bike ride. How these three things get accomplished are a matter of what's available and my own resourcefulness. But I guess that's where the adventure and adventure cycling comes in. And like I said, everybody's got their own way of doing things. As I get older, I'm always looking for ways to make bike touring just a little bit more comfortable. 
you know, short of staying home. But even at my age, I'm ready for almost anything. In 1981, when I was 17 years old, about a week after I graduated from high school, I jumped on my bike and rode from my home in the suburbs of Chicago to my uncle's house in Minnesota. It took me about seven days. I camped out along the way, and it was really my first big adventure. After that, I was hooked. My equipment was poor, and I really didn't know what I was doing, but I was having a blast. Since then, I've logged over 40,000 miles of bike touring. I learned mostly the hard way, by trial and error, and making tons of mistakes. I've always been a little uncomfortable with the term adventure guide. It seems to me that the more guide, the less adventure. But I guess even Lewis and Clark had Chicago We as a guide. So you need just enough guidance to get you out there and be safe, but not so much guidance that it ruins the adventure. My ultimate goal of making these videos is to motivate people to go out and ride their bike, even if just for the afternoon or go for a full-blown multi-day bike tour. I want you to find out all the details. I don't want to ruin your opportunity for discovery. If you're interested in bike touring and you're just getting started and you still have lots of questions, leave your questions in the comments below. I'll get back to you. If you've been biking for a while, I'm sure you've got your own system of doing things. So if you see something I'm doing you think is just crazy or you've got a better idea, hey, let me know in the comments section. But thanks again for riding along. I'll see you down the road. Just keep moving forward. Little by little, eventually you'll get there. If there's one thing I've learned from bike touring, if you just keep moving forward, no matter how slow, eventually you'll get to where you're going. Just keep moving forward, just keep moving down the road. And as always, thanks for watching. Now go ride your bike.